Hey everyone! Before the video starts, I want to mention that I'm going to be at PAX East next week, and since like 99% of you have no idea what I look like, I'm going to have a super quick update video at the end of the actual video. So if you're interested in seeing that, be sure to watch until the end to see all that. What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. With the release of Pokemon Home on the Nintendo Switch and mobile devices, the big objective that most people are going for right now is completing the national decks within the app. As we all know, there are a ridiculous amount of Pokemon that have been released since the games were created, but what does it take to get them all? Today we're going to find out how easy you can complete the living national decks for Pokemon Home. Obtaining the national decks in any game is quite a long journey, but for those who like to go the extra mile, hunting for a living Pokedex can really add a ton of playtime to your games. For those who don't know, a living Pokedex requires you to essentially capture each individual Pokemon, rather than catching a Pokemon and then evolving it to acquire its data entries. This may seem like a pretty tedious thing to do, but there are actually quite a few benefits to storing a living Dex in Pokemon Home. The most obvious is that you can complete the Pokedex in future games a lot faster, as you can just transfer them, which leaves you with only the new additions for the current game that you have to obtain. This also eliminates the need to ever look in the wild for a Pokemon if you really need one for something, but there are also some rewards you can get from doing it that we'll talk about later in the video. Now that we know all this, how exactly would you go about completing something like this? Before we go over everything, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe for more content like this. And with that out of the way, let's just get right into it. So as most of you know, in total there are currently 890 Pokemon in the franchise before alternate forms, which is an extremely daunting task no matter how many Pokemon you currently have. Just like the catch alls and pretty much every other challenge I've uploaded to this channel, we're going to take a look at this as if we don't have a single Pokemon yet, just so I can cover the full spectrum of everyone that's playing the game. Now I've been asked by quite a few people to cover this topic, so I knew that some of you would probably like to get as much info as you can so you can do this yourself. If you look in the description, I've made a spreadsheet that you can use to keep track of all 890 Pokemon that you need to complete your living decks, and I've added a few quality of life things to make it a lot easier to see your progress. If you go to file and then make a copy, you can save your own editable version of this to your Google Drive, and with this you can check off your collection and see your percentages, find the most accessible game to encounter the Pokemon you need, and even click on the Pokemon to get redirected to Cerebi's database for all encounters. I'm going to be updating this over time to make it the most complete and in-depth I can possibly make it, so be sure to check the version number in the document title to stay updated. Considering there are like 2,000 different ways you could go about completing your living decks, I spent a while trying to make the list of games and consoles required as low as it could possibly be. Obviously you could just have a copy of Sword and Shield and then trade 890 Wulu through the GTS, but I wanted to make this guide as simple as possible. I know some people might mention that you could just get one game out of every generation, but even then you could still be missing Pokemon. For example, if you had all of these games, you'd still be missing Celebi, and even if you switched out Silver for Crystal, that doesn't change the fact that you still can't get specific trade evolutions like Scizor, which has never been encounterable in any of the mainline Pokemon games. With this in mind, I managed to make a list that only requires 3DS and Switch games, and in total you only need two 3DSs and a single Switch. In addition, the list of games are relatively short too, so although this is still going to obviously be pricey, I think that the total won't be as much as you think it would be. I also want to mention that I'm not going to be listing off every encounter because this video would be like 3 hours long, but I'll try and make it as clear as possible so there isn't a bunch of confused comments. Okay, let's get started. The first games we're going to take a look at are Pokemon Sword and Shield. Considering these are currently the most relevant mainline games in the series at this point in time, I figured that starting here would be a good baseline to gauge what we should obtain from the rest of the games in the series. Although there are 400 Pokemon available in the Galar decks before any of the DLCs are added, it's important to know that just like any other Pokemon game, not every Pokemon is available in only one copy of the game. If we take into consideration that each game has 29 version exclusives across all the generations, each game is only able to collect 371 Pokemon, which is technically more than it really should be because you're only able to pick a single starter line throughout the entire game. Although it seems like you have to purchase the opposite game to collect everything, there are a few things you could do to make this a lot easier, as well as cost efficient. Because Pokemon Home supports a GTS feature, you could just catch a second batch of all the version exclusives that you can obtain, and then trade them asking for the Pokemon that are native to the other copy. A good example of this would be asking for something like Lotad for Seadot, Braviary for Mandibuzz, or Gumi for Jangmoo. If you gave it a few hours, I'm sure that you'd eventually collect every Pokemon that you need from the Galar Dax, so although I put in the guy that you need both Sword and Shield, you realistically don't, especially considering that all but obviously the Galar Pokemon are available in one way or another with the other games we're about to go over. 
There will definitely be a point in time when this won't be as simple, especially once everyone moves over to whatever the next game in the series is going to be, but for now Sword and Shield is unsurprisingly the best game to collect all the version exclusives. Now that this section has been taken care of, let's check out the games that will cover the remaining total. So we're going to look at this in chronological order of generation, which means that we're going to start out with the Kanto region. Currently there are three lines of games that we can choose from this generation, and realistically you can't go wrong with any of these choices because every game has like minimum 50 Kanto Pokemon, but I decided to go with either copy of Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee for this section. I know, I know. Let's Go is… different. But I chose this game for a couple of reasons. The main appeal for this one is the fact that you don't have to reset your game unlike the other options. All three starters and fossils can be easily collected, which saves you a ridiculous amount of time in comparison to the other games, which require you to get to Cinnabar Island before you can revive your ancient fossils. The other important advantage is the fact that transferring them is insanely easy. If you did Fire Red and Leaf Green, you'd have to transfer them the whole way like I did in my last video, and even with the virtual console versions, you can only transport one box at a time, which isn't terrible, but it can still take a decent chunk of your day. If you've played these games before, you'd know that the games are extremely easy to run through, so in comparison to the other Gen 1 based games, you should realistically finish the decks the fastest. With the way I laid out this guide, if you choose either Let's Go Pikachu or Eevee, you can get 78 Pokemon from Kanto. The Pokemon that are excluded from this list are ones like version exclusives and trade evolutions like Alakazam and Golem. Because we're going to have to trade with another game to get these, it would be much cheaper and much more efficient to do this in a completely different game. When it comes to the Generation 2 Pokemon, there are really only two convenient options, as the remakes were on the DS, which would require you to transfer your catches in batches of 6 through Generation 5, and then into Pokemon Bank. Thankfully Game Freak released Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal on the 3DS's eShop, and since it directly connects with Bank through the Poke Transporter, you can migrate them with a little bit of box moving like the previous generation. Now if you've played all the Pokemon games throughout the series lifespan, you'd know that the Johto Pokemon are lightly sprinkled into each dex. In most cases, you'll find like 20 to 40 at most, which can make this group somewhat difficult to collect, but Game Freak has done a pretty solid job on making every Pokemon within a relatively short path to Pokemon Home. For this section, I chose to use a copy of Pokemon Crystal on the Virtual Console. Initially, some of you are probably thinking that this is a peculiar choice, as it's a lot harder to catch Pokemon in the older games, and transferring them is a lot more tedious, but there is one small thing that I mentioned earlier that basically forces you to play through this game. Celebi. Although the original English versions don't include Celebi, in the Virtual Console you're able to obtain the GS Ball right after you defeat the Elite Four. Within the US, this is currently the only way to obtain Celebi, as it hasn't been catchable in any of the mainline games. I know a few people might mention that you can use the coin case glitch in Gold and Silver and get whatever Pokemon you want, but I wanted to go about this without any glitches, but I also won't ignore the fact that it would make Gens 1 and 2 significantly easier. With the guide I set up, you should collect 58 Pokemon from Crystal, which is a little over half the entire Johto decks. It doesn't sound like much, but that's because there are quite a lot of them available in either copy of Sword and Shield. The only notable things that I'll mention about this is that I listed all three starter lines because it's pretty easy to just transfer them to bank through a new save file, and then hatch them in Generation 7 rather than having to complete the story three times. You could totally breed them in Crystal, but hatching is dreadfully slow in these games because of the bike speed, so it's definitely much better to just bring them to a newer game. Aside from that, these Pokemon are relatively easy to obtain, and the ones that I didn't include were Trade Evolutions and all the Pokemon that are just completely uncatchable. When it comes to taking care of the Generation 3 Pokemon, it should come as no surprise that either Omega Ruby or Alpha Sapphire are the best options at this point in time. Although people are spending a lot of time transferring Pokemon right now, the 3DS games are oddly some of the cheapest games to grab, as most of them are still under their retail value, while the DS and GBA games are selling for about 10 to even 30 over from the retailers like GameStop. Although about a tenth of the Galar Pokedex contains Pokemon from the Hoenn region, this still leaves a little under 100 remaining that we're going to have to collect. On the upside, we once again have the option of choosing either game, as all but 4 total version exclusives are available in Sword and Shield. This game is also the start of collecting the remaining generations that aren't on the 3DS or Switch. Generation 4 and 5 are heavily present in all of the 3DS games, which makes this process pretty simple, but it can tend to be a little chaotic if you're jumping from game to game. When it comes to non-Hoenn Pokemon, we can pick up a couple more from Gens 1 and 2, as well as about 30 from Gens 4 and 5. Some notable selections are Regigigas because of our easy access to the original trio, as well as the Gen 5 starters are available as well. You're only able to collect one per save file, however we'll talk about more options in a little bit. 
Another huge appeal of these games is the fact that we can once again get another mythical Pokemon, and this is arguably the easiest one out of them all. If you play until the end of the post game, you can catch Deoxys, which is extremely convenient considering that it's not only in a mainline game, but you don't need an event of any sort to be able to obtain it. Speaking of events, the only part that will probably give people trouble is obtaining both Latios and Latios. In order to obtain both on one copy, you'll have to street pass with somebody who already has the Eon ticket on their copy of the game. The odds of this happening in 2020, if you live in anything but a bustling city, is pretty much slim to none, but fortunately there are other games where they're still accessible. In total, I picked out 113 for this section, which will give us just under 75% of the total national decks in the series. Like I mentioned earlier, we're not going to use any of the DS games to move Pokemon, so instead of looking at Gens 4 and 5, we're just going to continue with the 3DS titles with Pokemon X or Y. This section is by far the oddest one out of the bunch, as a majority of the encounters you have to collect aren't even from Generation 6. For some reason, Sword and Shield has like 70% of the entire Kalos decks, which isn't saying much because that's like 50 Pokemon, but regardless, the majority of your playtime will consist of you catching the previous two generations. X and Y have arguably the easiest encounters out of all the games, as most encounters I've included are very easy to find, and on top of that, it's pretty easy to level up your Pokemon once you've got them. In total, these games are the second shortest, with only 76 Pokemon. And realistically, you should be able to finish this in probably the same amount of time that it would take you to complete Let's Go. Although you can only pick one of the Kalos fossils, the other option is easily accessible in the next game, so feel free to grab whatever one you need. The technical final games that we're going to look at are all part of Generation 7, and all four games have their own positives and negatives to a challenge like this. I chose to go for Ultra Sun and Moon for this part, but I want to mention a couple things about regular Sun and Moon before we get into that. Although both of these games are almost entirely similar in just about every way, there are a few exclusive encounters that are extremely important, that a lot of people might not consider. Within Generation 7, you can use the Island Scan feature to encounter Pokemon in relatively the same style as Hordes from Generation 4. With this you can encounter all the Unova starters, which would really help out considering that you can only obtain one of the three in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. This is basically the only upside to getting one of these games, and considering there isn't anything else that's only obtainable in these games, I decided to not include it. The GTS for Ultra Sun and Moon is still pretty active, so there's a good chance you'll be able to get specific Pokemon like that anyways, but if you plan to do this with only your Pokemon, you'll probably need to grab a copy of one of these games. Now let's take a look at the enhanced versions. Ultra Sun and Moon are what I'd like to call the cleanup games as there are a ton of Pokemon available to catch across every generation, and it is by far the most convenient game to get everything done. Aside from Sword and Shield, these are the only games where I recommend getting both copies of the game, as this is by far the most convenient location to trade all the Pokemon that you need to evolve, and this game is arguably one of the fastest to breed eggs, with Sword and Shield only being the faster option. If we take a look at the list of Pokemon required, it's basically the polar opposite to X and Y, as most of the Alola region isn't in Sword and Shield. This isn't really too surprising because the games are only two years apart, and it was also a good marketing strategy because it incentivizes that you should buy these games as well if you really want to catch them all. A solid 95% of these encounters are very unique as they're almost all stone evolutions, trade evolutions, starter Pokemon, version exclusives for other games, legendaries, and ultra beasts. And when you add up all those from every game, it results in a pretty large portion of the decks. Through the island scan feature we can obtain the Hoenn, Sinnoh, and Kalos starters, so this way you can pick whatever starter you want in the other 3DS games, and it will make zero impact on what you can and can obtain. Through both games we can also collect the box legendaries and pre-evolutions, and all of the Ultra Beasts including the Poi Pole line. The greatest appeal for these games by far though is the Ultra Warp Ride, where you can encounter every legendary up until this generation, which is pretty much the main reason why you have the choice of picking whatever games you want for X and Y and Oras. When it comes to version exclusives, almost all of them are Ultra Beasts and Legendaries, so at least you can obtain all of them in one place, rather than jumping around trying to catch everything. Although I know a lot of people aren't fans of these games, there aren't any other games that contain the Ultra Beasts, so unless you want to sift through Zashian and Zamazenta requests on the GTS to get the opposite game's exclusives, you're going to have to get both copies. The last thing I want to note about these games is that there is another mythical Pokemon available, as you can scan a QR code to obtain Magearna. This is basically the only way you can get one for your living decks, but thankfully you can obtain it whenever you want. In total there are 147 Pokemon obtainable between both games, which leaves us with only 18 Pokemon left to obtain in the decks. But what exactly are they? The remaining group of encounters are known as mythical Pokemon. 
In most cases, these are the hardest Pokemon to collect, and that's entirely because of their exclusivity. These Pokemon are only given out for special events, which makes them extremely sought after. If you go into the GTS and Pokemon Home, you'll notice that basically every listing is asking for them, which initially doesn't seem like a terrible idea. The issue is that ever since the GTS has been available, you aren't allowed to trade any mythical Pokemon over any of the online hubs, aside from trading with a person on your friends list. Currently, there are 21 mythicals in the national decks, and there are even more on the way, as one is going to be announced next week for Pokemon Day, and Sword and Shield's DLCs will probably have some thrown in there as well. When it comes to obtaining them, some of them range from super easy to almost impossible, so let's go over what we can and can obtain. Throughout the video, we've already obtained the three easiest ones, Celebi, Deoxys, and Magearna, and these are essentially the only mythicals that are available in the base mainline Pokemon games. However, there are some others you can obtain if you have some additional items. If you purchased the Pokeball Plus, or got one with your copy of Let's Go Pikachu or Eevee, you can use that to get a Mew that you can transfer up to home. These are still available at most retailers as of the date this video goes up, but I wouldn't be surprised if they stopped selling them within the next year. Although you can buy them used, you're only allowed to get one Mew per Pokeball Plus, so odds are your chances of getting one aren't going to be too high. Meltan and Melmetal are also technically free Pokemon, with the only requirement being that you have a Pokemon Go account, and one of the Let's Go games. If you transfer Pokemon from the app to the game, you'll unlock a special box that will allow you to catch Meltan for a short period of time. This is pretty easy to do, but getting its evolution is much more difficult. Melmetal is the only evolution version exclusive in the franchise's history, as you can only evolve it within Pokemon Go. You're going to need to get a whopping 400 candies, which is very tedious to do, but on top of that, you have to wait a week between using the Meltan box. This means you can pretty much only get around 60 to 70 candies per week, which means it will take over a month just to get this single Pokemon. On the upside, it doesn't seem like it'll ever be a timed event, and you can also get rare candies from raid battles that you can make into Meltan candies. But this is by far one of the most tedious ones out of the group. Now let's talk about more difficult ones. If you happen to have a copy of the English Pokemon Coliseum bonus disc, you can still obtain Jirachi if you have a copy of Ruby or Sapphire, but these discs typically go for about $50 to $70, and if I'm being honest, it's not worth the price because that's literally all you get from the game. Manaphy can still be obtained through copies of Pokemon Ranger, which will also allow you to breed it to get Fione, but just like the Pokeball Plus, you can only get one per cartridge, so the odds of finding one a decade later is pretty unlikely. Darkrai, Shaman, and Arceus are technically still available in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl through the tweaking glitch, and I know that I said I wanted to avoid any exploits, but this is literally the only way to access these events at this point. If you're interested in doing this, it takes about 30 minutes to get them all, and my good friend Retire made a bunch of videos on how to do it in the fastest way possible. If you're interested in that, I've linked his videos in the description. Tell him I sent you. When it comes to getting the Gen 5 Mythicals, Victini, Keldeo, Meloetta, and Genesect, there's another exploit that allows you to actually re-download the mystery gifts that were originally available during that generation. If you're interested in doing that, another YouTuber, <clears throat> I mean my arch rival, JRose11 uploaded a video recently covering that, so I'll also have his video linked in the description. Despite being my sworn enemy, he also does a bunch of other really interesting videos, so I'd highly recommend subscribing to him if you haven't already. If you followed the steps so far, this will leave you with the 5 mythicals for Gen 6 and 7. Deancey, Hoopa, Volcanion, Marshadow, and Zeraora. Currently, these events are unavailable, and there really isn't any way to obtain them aside from straight up hacking them in. But have no fear, there are still some things I can suggest to help you out. There are multiple subreddits that are frequently active with trades. r slash Pokemon trades, casual Pokemon trades, and even Pokemon giveaway has a great potential to get you those final Pokemon that you need. Some sections of these subreddits don't allow event trades, but there's a pretty good chance that you could get some of the mythicals if you check the new posts every day. If you manage to get all the mythicals, they'll bring your total to 890 Pokemon and a complete living dex, which will only increase within the next 3 months. Now if you take the time to bring every single one of these to Pokemon Home and create a full living dex, you'll definitely be compensated for it. If you check your mystery gifts, you should have a prize waiting for you that will allow you to claim Magearna. While this seems kind of anticlimactic, this pattern of Magearna has never been actually released before, so this quickly became one of the rarest Pokemon ever released. Thankfully, you can take your time with this one, as it seems like it can be obtained whenever you want. But keep in mind that once you unlock it, you have a month to claim it before it's gone forever. And with that, we've successfully obtained the current living national decks in Pokemon Home. But how did I do? So let's review. Overall, I think that the Magearna reward is definitely worth the tedious amount of hours to claim it, 
as most people probably won't bother trying to go for it, or even know that it actually exists. I find it a little strange that they didn't just give out its shiny form, because that's never been released, but this is by far my favorite Pokemon variant that they've ever revealed. Once again, if you're interested in doing this for yourself, I've linked my spreadsheet in the description, and feel free to pass this video around to as many people as you know. Admittedly, I had my decks taken care of long before Home came out, so I made this guide solely for everyone else that's planning to do the same thing. So it made a lot to me if you shared this with anyone that you know that has Pokemon Home. If you end up completing your living decks, tweet me your progress at JohnstoneYT. Other than that, that's all there is to say about completing the living national decks for Pokemon Home. Hey, full disclaimer, I'm not good at live commentary, so I'm going to be reading off a script. So if I keep looking like up and down, that's that's why I'm doing that. So like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm going to be attending PAX East in Boston, Massachusetts next week. So if you'd like to meet up with me, I just wanted to make a little bit of an update video so you guys know what I look like. So it's not hard to find me. Uh, wow, this is rough. And just so you know, I'm going to be going on Friday and Saturday. So if you're going on any of the other days, I probably won't be at the venue, but I will be in the relative area. Uh, I know that we are planning to do a, a meetup outside of the venue with a bunch of other Pokemon content creators, uh, just so you don't have to pay like 50 bucks <laughs> just to come say hi to me. Admittedly, I have no idea exactly when we're going to do it, but I do know that we're going to do it during the time frame of PAX East, so it's going to be between some time of like Thursday to Sunday. Um, but I will keep that information posted on my Twitter account, so if you do follow me on there, you'll be able to know exactly when we're going to be meeting up. I'm planning to post an update the day before and probably the morning of when we're going to do the meetup, so just keep posted on my Twitter and you'll know exactly when that happens. I also want to do this because the majority of you have no idea what I look like, so if you end up seeing me or my girlfriend at the venue at any point, feel free to come say hi, don't, don't hesitate, don't be afraid to, to come up to me because that would just... Be weird. I don't know what I'm saying. If you've been to the venue before, a lot of us are going to be at the handheld lounge, uh, which I believe is on the second floor. I'm not entirely sure on that, but I know that they have an app and obviously they have little maps so you can look to find out exactly where it's going to be. But that's basically where most of the content creators are going to be. But if you don't see me anywhere in that area, you can just tweet at me and I will try and meet up with you at some point during my time there. I believe that we're going to be there for probably three, four hours at a time, maybe a little bit less than that, but I will try my best to accommodate for everybody or at least as many people as I possibly can. A worst case scenario, we'll have that meet up so you guys can meet us there if you miss me during one of those two days that I'm going to be there. Um, because I don't think I'm going to be, we're going to be doing the meetup on those specific days. Because I know the majority of the people that I'm going to be going with are going on Friday and Saturday. So it'd be kind of silly for us to do a meetup on the same day. Maybe not. I don't really know. It's not really in total control. So <laughs> I guess we'll just kind of see where that goes. But either way, I will try and make time for everybody, as many people as I can, at least. I also want to take a second to thank you guys for helping me reach 200,000 subscribers. And I know that you've probably heard every YouTuber thank you speech under the sun. So I'll just kind of keep it very brief and just say that I am very appreciative of every single one of you. Um, my life over the past, uh, I don't know, six months has been an absolute roller coaster. So I have uh, moved from New Hampshire all the way down to Georgia and I moved into a new home so I can you know, record in, in, a, in a nice room rather than a cramped up closet. If you've seen my, um, my older videos, you know that that's like, I had this insanely small room where I record basically everything. And I had neighbors that would, you know, like I didn't want to disturb them with me doing voiceovers every single week. So it's nice to have like this, this open area where I can just scream and make noises as much as I would like to do. But I ended up moving down to Georgia just so I could be closer to a lot of other Pokemon content creators like United Gamer, uh, Lex Plays, Asteroid, King Corfish, TJ Games, Linz, Brooks, and probably some more at this rate. I'm sure that uh, some other people like Short Tempered are going to be coming and moving down here at, at some point this year. So um, large group of creators. And I just wanted to move down just so I was kind of closer in, in, in a more um, YouTuber environment, I guess. I just wanted to be um, around people that I could potentially work with in the future on, on other endeavors. Um, but yeah, that's basically why I moved down here. With all that in mind, this would have been completely impossible if it weren't for the insane amount of support that you guys have shown me over the past two years. Uh, and in addition to being in a new house, I want to do a bunch of additional things like uh, live streams. I did a poll on my YouTube channel asking if I should do live streams. I think it was like last week. And there were over 25,000 people who said that they would be interested in doing that. So I guess 
I will do that at some point. I also don't know exactly how I'm going to do it because I don't want to like litter my channel with a bunch of VODs from previous videos. So odds are I'm going to probably upload them to a second channel of some sort that I'll make in the future or I'll just stream on that other channel. I'm really not sure exactly how I'm going to do that, but just keep in mind that when whenever I do the live streams, it's not going the channel's not going to look any different. Anyways, thank you guys for sitting through this very poorly edited update video and for your continuous support on every single one of my videos. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing as we'll be making more videos like this very soon. If you have any suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.